This episode is sponsored by Factor Meals, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit. The night is approaching, though some would say it was morning. You're listening to Nakedly Examined Music, a podcast about songs and songwriters. My name is Mark Lintonmeyer. My guest for episode 203 is Andy White, a singer-songwriter that released his first EP in Ireland in 1985. You're right now hearing Vision of You, the biggest single from his first LP, Rave On, from 1986. He's now released 16 solo albums, plus a few collaborations. We'll be discussing one of those collaborations, AT, that is Andy White and Tim Finn of Split Ends and Crowded House fame. The song is The Happiness Index from their eponymous album released this year. We'll then talk about the title track from his solo album, The Guilty and the Innocent from 2017, and the song Speechless from his 1992 album, Out There. We'll conclude by listening to Italian Girls on Mopeds from his 2003 album, Boy 40. Get more information at andywhite.com. Get more about this podcast at nakedlyexaminedmusic.com. And to support the effort, go to patreon.com slash nakedlyexaminedmusic. I will play a little bit of Vision of You from your first full LP, Rave On 1986. But we're going to get pretty quickly to the new stuff. Can we characterize for the folks, what, 16 albums, I think, believe? So, 16 solo albums plus the two with Tim Finn and, and two with Stephen Fearing. Can we characterize? I'm glad you've counted that? them. That's great. You've counted them. <laughs> I've started saying 20. Okay. I wasn't counting live albums. I'm picky about... <laughs> Actually, I probably counted whatever was on Wikipedia is probably what it came down to, but... Right. Well, it's always correct, as we know. I mean, has there... I can hear changes in your sound over time that you sort of started with a little more straightforward, folky thing, and of course, have investigated lots of different avenues since then, but you still fundamentally tour, right? All your performances are as a solo artist, so it has to work with guitar and vocal. Is that correct? Yeah, it has to work with just me going out on my own. I always really wanted to be independent and not have to rely on anybody else. And I was kind of trained like that as well. When, from when I was very young, I started off being a bit of an outsider in Belfast. Like What I was doing was always different from other people. And I was growing up in this chaotic quite violent environment, not feeling like I could express myself. And then I found a way of expressing myself. I heard my voice on the radio when I heard punk groups who were from exactly where I was from. When punk was just starting, they're like the really original punk in the 70s when I was a teenager. There's a movie called Good Vibrations, which really, if you watch that, it shows you what my teenage years were like. I wasn't as old as the characters in the film. It's about a record shop in Belfast. It's a bit like High Fidelity or it's a little more like 24-hour party people, which is about Manchester. But I mean, it's actually, this is a better film and it was written by a friend of mine. But I, I grew up in Belfast, like a very strange place with a beautiful home environment. And I was kind of sheltered from all the trouble, but you couldn't really get away from it. It was like growing up in an and time and a place of complete political unrest. And I kind of knew that I had to look after my own thing. I was managed for years by Peter Jenner, who's a very famous English manager. And he managed Billy Bragg and had managed lots of groups in the past, like The Clash and Ian Jury and the Blockheads and Pink Floyd when they started, like loads of groups. And really, he was very, very clear about lots of things. His father was a Marxist vicar. He's still alive. He's a wonderful person. And he's really strong about you've got to be able to tour on your own with a guitar. It'll always work. You don't need to depend on companies or groups having arguments and breaking up. You've got to do your own thing. That was one of the things he was very strong about. Well, that seems a great segue into something that has nothing to do with that. An actual collaboration with this thing with the AT album over the internet with Tim Finn. Am I gathering from the episodes that I've heard so far of your uh, excellent songwriting podcast, which I made sure to pick something you hadn't specifically covered in a whole full 20 minute session. Were the two of you actually in a room for any part of this song, for instance? The good thing was that Tim and I spent so many mm -hmm. good times in many different rooms that we kind of didn't need to be in the room and we couldn't be in the room because I was in Melbourne and he was in Auckland 
And it was actually before lockdown. But I guess it does segue a little bit from what we were talking about, the independence you need. Peter always said, you should, you've got to own your own masters. You've got to be able to in, be in charge of the means of production. And you can actually make records now. You can control your masters, so you control what happens with them. And you can get whatever profit there is. And I guess that segues a little bit into that. Artists can do it themselves now. We can write, record, produce and release ourselves. And I discovered that. And Tim suddenly discovered that, yeah, he could record with his beautiful microphone at home in Auckland. And we were asked by a New Zealand movie if we would give permission for a song from our original album, Altitude, to be part of the soundtrack. And that just got Tim and I talking again. And one thing led to another, and we ended up writing together and just exchanging files on the internet. So during the writing of At AT album, no, we never were in the same room together. And that's why the cover is very special to me, because after that very long process, we met in Melbourne on this kind of momentous day. And the photographs are all from that day when we actually were together at the same time. Well, let's introduce before you play in full, the second last track from the album, The Happiness Index, I wanted to pick something that was not typical of the rest of the album or really most of your catalog, that it has a more, it's sort of the closest to dance pop that is on there with this giant thundering drums that start things off and yeah. Rock drums. Any words about the conception of it before folks hear it? Each of the songs is started in a completely different way. The very first song was started because our former bandmate and co-writer, Liam O'Wainley, was interviewed in a Dublin tourist magazine. And they started asking about the group that we were in, that he was in with Tim and I. And they were at the sea. And I don't know if any of you, your listeners will have watched Bad Sisters, the TV series about these amazing sisters in Dublin. It's, it's a streaming series. And they all meet at this place called the 40 Foot, which used to be a gentleman's bathing place. And it's actually in Ulysses by James Joyce, like it's a real historical place. And that's where Tim, Liam and I used to meet. And the Dublin Tourist Magazine asked Liam, what was it like that time? And he said, the sea holds the memory. That's, he just came out with this beautiful poetic phrase. That really started Tim and I writing the whole album. And we started each song in a different way. And this one started off with a drum sample of a really great drummer called Ricky Fatar, who used to be in Tim's band, and I think was in the Beach Boys. And he was definitely in, there was a very funny parody the Ruttles? of Is the that? Beatles called The Ruttles. That's how I knew Ricky. But Tim knew him as a serious drummer. And Tim always had this sample of him playing this thundering drum pattern. He sent me the drum pattern with the first vocal of the first verse, I think, of Happiness Index. The other thing was the Tim and I, I know we've talked a long, many years about Buddhist thinking and about more enlightened systems of government and religion and perhaps we're cursed with like in lots of the world. And I was fascinated by Bhutan and the Happiness Index, where their gross national product is actually measured by the happiness of the people. And Tim and I were talking about that because like, we've known about this as a concept for years, and Bhutan has had it as a concept for years. Obviously, when global organizations get a hold of this, they start thinking, okay, let's make a league table of countries to see who's happiest. And it's like the commercial world trying to just line up countries in terms that they understand. And Bhutan doesn't come anywhere near the top of the happiness index, the only country which is really taking this seriously. All the Scandinavian countries are always at the top. And you can guess who's at the bottom. So we thought this was something for a song, for sure. This is the happiness index. Assessment, my 
Yes, let's talk about the ideology for, of this for a second. So I, I was thinking that, you know, the fact that it's quantified, that this was a criticism. I didn't know that it actually came from Bhutan. I mean, obviously it says it in the song, but that you were actually seeing this as some sort of enlightened move on their part, as opposed to we only can measure the wealth via the GDP of nations. And so economists are sort of notoriously oversimplify and to the point of falsification <laughs> such, such that the economic ind- indicators can look great, but yet on the ground, things can look pretty terrible. Is this actually an improvement over that or the fact that it's still trying to quantify still is dehumanizing and <laughs> problematic? So it does criticize it because it takes something which is very genuine. They actually surveyed the citizen's happiness and then they factored that in to budgets and government policy. Like it was really enlightened. And then the rest of the world doesn't survey humanity and factor in people's happiness to their decisions. They did what you just described better than I can, which is they look at that happiness index in the same terms as economic in the future to line up countries in the usual kind of lists that they have. And I would think it would be a little problematic to ask this just as a survey question internationally, you know, unless you're actually looking at behaviors or something like that, even that might be difficult. I can imagine just to use a cliche here, but the German people saying we are very happy. 
we are productive, we are, you know, that they, they have a different definition <laughs> if you look at their self-reporting. It becomes really problematic. You're right. Because I would have thought New Zealand, for example, would be right near the top. It is pretty high up. When you meet people from New Zealand, A, they're always really nice and they're friendly, intelligent, like considerate, kind, but they're not actually at the top. I think they take, I think the whatever world organization has come up with this happiness index have factored in lots of economic things as well as actual people's feel, well-being, which is how it started out. So it was just a, exactly the kind of thing that Tim and I would be into writing about. There's a song called The Refuge Tree on Altitude, which really came from an idea of retreat and looking after your own well-being, which is really important. And I think the happiness index really is like, the happiness index rises and falls, like the moon and the tides inside of us all. You know, it's not always going to be really great, and it's not always going to be really bad. It's it's like taking stock of things. But it's a bit of a punch as well. And I think we were writing it. So it's that middle bit where I'm like, get on a soapbox, and it's like clowns that do a better job of looking after the circus. It's so true. Come on. I think the leaders at the time were Boris Johnson in the UK. It's like a disaster area. But I mean, it's just like, what are we doing here, guys? What is going on, eh? Talk about the, the vocal approach here. So it sounds like it's a mix of Tim singing two parts and you more or less talking through the whole thing, though I wasn't really sure if you were just trying to match one of his lower parts. In any case, I know from hearing you on your podcast talk about, since you're primarily a writer in terms of text, and that often it will just be, I'm delivering a poem, and if I feel like I should break into song, then I will do that, but it's, it's optional. So how does this song line up with, in terms of that and having a pre-existent Tim vocal there, I guess, to play off of? It's very exciting, Mark, getting a vocal from Tim in the mail. It's like he's a superb singer. Like I've been in the studio and heard, was privileged enough to be in a studio and Sinead O'Connor sang in one of my songs. And it's like, just knocks your head off. Like you can't believe the power and the emotional impact of hearing Sinead sing in a studio and she's just got a special quality to her voice like and I'm glad the world has actually listened to a lot of Sinead O'Connor singing over the past few weeks because she's such an amazing artist and when Tim sends you a vocal it's got that it's just got that magic quality about it and his melody the way he writes melodies is remarkable I mean, people are so used nowadays to writing songs over chord patterns. They don't really write from a melody, but you do get the sense that Tim has a melody and he's going to fit the chords to the melody, not the other way around. It's very unusual. So most of the songs of this record sound like they come from the melody and the melody of the Happiness Index is very beautiful. What would happen would be Tim doesn't stack up vocals at the start anyway. There's a couple of the songs where he has like three or four vocals on each track. But that one, I would double it and do a really low one, which you can hardly hear, like a very low one, a very high one. And then we didn't always do this, but in this song, if I think about it, it just stopped. Like a lot of the things would be like a verse and a chorus, and that would be it. And then I would maybe double it, and then we would write another one. And so Tim kept singing the Happiness Index. And then I would build a bridge over the drum pattern and put on thousands of guitars. I put on so many guitars in this track, but it is bombshell revelation. Tim claims this is the only guitar solo he's ever played in his career. Ah, okay. At the end. And then he walked it back and said, it's not a solo. It's just like a sort of riff, high up sort of riff thing, but I'm, I'm calling it a solo. And I'm, so I'm it's not the same guitar that he's playing throughout this. Wow, wow, you know, just this, these blats, these horn like. It's like, yeah, those things. And then I just put on loads more electric guitars on top of that and had an idea for the string arrangement, which was a big deal. Oh, no, it's not a big deal in this song. You can't really hear it. But <laughs> yeah, I was trying to think like there's organ going through it. There's these electronic bleeps and like, you know, it's got to be a patch or a sample or something. This thing that comes right at the beginning with the drums, with these little electronic firecrackers shooting off in all directions. 
That sounds very exciting. That's what I'm going to say it is. It's electronic <laughs> firecrackers shooting off in all directions. I guess firecrackers actually have a sound. That is not that sound. So that's not but the visual aspect. Because <laughs> they're always, I mean, it's very instinctive. I do it very quickly. But obviously you're thinking of statistics and electronics. and As you're having fun adding layers here, I like some of the the vocal buildup, you know, over the war will set us free that I wrote split ends circusy. And the way that you end this, like. Do you remember where in the process that came? Like, is that part of the sort of that outro riff? You know, as soon as you were writing that part of the song that was there, or was there a gap where it was like, what, what it's going to. There was a gap and I jumped in because it is quite competitive at times, which is good without having to be in a room. Being competitive, it's like people listening will have heard stories of Paul and John, John and Paul singing, you know, writing bits and you're trying to get in another bit you've either written or trying to jump in and better each other, which is really why co-written songs can become such great songs. It's like a very friendly competition. The mixer wins, right? The mixer decides which part was too much. So is it a third part? You guys send it off somewhere else? to make those final decisions or is it already, you know, you play these rough mixes on your podcast. So is it, you're sending that to the actual mixer? Like, well, this is approximately the kind of balance, but you decide, you decide, you make the drum sound nicer. Yeah. We put all the ideas down we've got. So there might be like eight electric guitars. Tim's like main electric guitar. There might be about three basses. Like ever since altitude, I've always played like loads of basses on songs. It's really great doing that. There's that Ricky Vitar drum sample, but also my son, Sebastian, played an actual drum kit on top of the sample. And that's really what gives it a lot of its power, that there's an actual, you know, 28-year-old drummer going full blast at the drum kit as well as the Ricky Vitar drums. Then there might be stacks of vocals, if I'm going, the clowns would do a better job, you know, in, in with all the cities and everything, that bit, the middle bit, the bridge might have a vocal. It might, I've got a megaphone. It's got like I'm screaming through a megaphone. There's a lot of stuff going on. So that is too much for me to mix because I just keep adding stuff to it and we end up with something which sounds great and exciting, but it's not probably acceptable. And also to make the decisions that you're talking about, like, Whose vocal should be louder than the other one? It's great having somebody who doesn't know who has written what bit. Because again, you can normally tell who's written which lyric by who's singing it. And when I was very young, like we had Revolver, like Revolver is probably the first record I really remember as an album. It actually told you who's singing lead, which is such a weird thing to do. The only band that it's totally unnecessary to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but by 1966, they're still telling you who sang lead. And really, you can, you can normally tell who's written, certainly the major part of it, by who's singing. But in some cases, it's not true. And it's good to have a mixer who, who can't just tell that. Having an objective ear is good. And what we did was send it off to the third person in the project. And there really were three people in the project because John Leckie, who's a very well-known mixer and producer, was a really big part of this project. He didn't just mix it. He kind of mixed it as a labor of love. And he did that during lockdown in England when he lives in a beautiful house in the countryside, miles from the nearest village, and just him and his wife. And they spent a lot of time inside, inside the house during the lockdown years. And that's where John mixed it. And it took him about a year to mix it. He did it very slowly. And John is a wonderful man. And again, everybody listening to the podcast will have one record that John has worked on because he started working at Abbey Road in 1969. And he worked on solo Beatles records, Pink Floyd. The most famous recent things he might have done were the Muse albums. He produced the bands by Radiohead. John's CV is just like enormous. Given that, were there songs on this that you get it back and you make him redo something? Like, could you just, I really like that one guitar and you just submerged it. I need to, you know, or is it just, no, his word is law. Well, that's the thing. It's so funny because 
I know how fussy Tim is with his vocals, like how loud they are, how quiet they are. And every producer and mixer knows that the vocalist either doesn't want you to want to hear the vocal at all, but usually the vocal has to be louder than everything else. So when I do my podcast and I listen back to the rough mixes, I think, oh, yeah, of course, it's the lead vocalist doing the mix because the vocals are really loud. So when you get the mixes back, and John, from that history of recording, I've just related some of it. It's like an English mix. It's like, this, listen to the Stone Roses record. It's not loud, the vocals. Even Muse isn't really loud. And the thing about John is you usually think the vocals are slightly too quiet because I'm a lead vocalist and they should be amazingly loud. But actually, when you listen back to records that he's made where you were wondering, you were kind of 50-50 about it, but you said yes because he knows best, then you know that he did know best because when you listen back to John's stuff, everything's just at the right level. And I had met John with Tim years ago at Peter Gabriel's studio in England after Alt played a festival called WOMAD, which is... It was originally one festival in England. WOMAD, W-O-M-A-D, stands for World of Music, Arts and Dance. And Peter Gabriel set them up to really provide a platform for world music artists from everywhere across the globe, artists he, he knew. He knew how good they were, and they weren't necessarily able to come and tour on their own in the UK. So he built a platform for them to come and present them as a whole festival. And we were invited. And after the initial WOMAD festivals, Peter would invite all the artists back to his studio to record for free, just collaborate, record. And he was writing a project called Big Blue Ball at the time. I have it pulled up here. I will link folks to, because, you know, Peter Gabriel didn't put out an album for a long time. And so any little thing that he would do, it's like, oh, will there be one song that he finally... But yes, I had read about that, you know, the two of you being a lyric writing crew during that project. It's pretty. Yeah, we were there and it was remarkable. And, and the two of us, as well as that co-writing thing with Peter and a, a beautiful group of musicians, amazing people in that room when we wrote the whole thing. But we also recorded a song of mine called, well, Tim and I wrote a song called Because She Loves It, which is on one of the records. It's on Teenage. That was the first thing that John recorded for us. We, John, we just walked in the room and John is the person recording us. And that's the first time we met him, just got on straight away. And I've kept up with him, been lucky enough to be mentored by him as regards recording. Like if I want to know about when I was starting putting a studio together, I just asked John, John, what do I need? And he'd tell me the three microphones you need to have. And there's only three. And the kind of equipment, like the hardware sort of stuff. And I just learned a lot from John. And we've remained friends. And I asked him if he would do this, and he was delighted to do it. It was good. Let's stop and talk about Factor Meals. With the busy fall season already in swing, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. I have scarfed down several of these recently, and they're all quite good. You know the meal kit thing. Well, this is one better because you don't have to actually combine the ingredients. You just heat it up in the oven if you're patient, in the microwave if you're not. Factors fresh, never frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. And it's a great way, if you're too busy to cook, to make sure you're eating well. These are upscale meals with premium ingredients like broccolini, leeks, truffle butter, asparagus. They've got at least 34 weekly options. I am looking at a bunch of empty boxes of what they sent to me, like roasted veggie and pesto tortellini, creamy Parmesan chicken, vegan mushroom marsala, jalapeno lime cheddar chicken with spicy cilantro, cauliflower, quote unquote, rice. They're all pretty low calorie. And you can, in fact, specify, hey, I want the calorie conscious options with around 550 or less calories per serving. Or you could do the protein plus meals with 30 grams of protein or more per serving. They've got special lunch to go options, grain bowls, salad toppers. They have snacks, breakfast items, juices, shakes and smoothies. So get factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. 
You simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door, ready in two minutes, no prep, no mess. Head to Factormeals.com slash NEM50 and use code NEM50 to get 50% off. That's code NEM50 at Factormeals.com slash NEM50 to get 50% off. All right, I don't want to spend the whole interview on the one song, but I do have two more questions about it. First is just that first melody that I was trying to think where I'd heard this, like, and it's because it's, you've got to be someone, it's got to be now, which is a, my favorite part in many's the time from your previous album. Like that is the melody. That's a waltz. It's not the same thing, but it's the same shape that you then took that. And even though that only comes up once in that whole many's the time, that's such a nice rip. Let's just make that the main thing and have that repeat over and over in this song. Were you guys even aware of that, that that's the same? Was that intentional or am I blowing your mind? <laughs> that is a revelation. Mark, you've done it, man. This is musicology. This is like top level. This is great. I'd never, ever once thought of it. I've heard it a thousand times. Got to be now. Of course. It's the, it's the same melody. Beautiful. Okay. Well, I hope that's not disappointing to Tim. I, when you think melodically, because I also write thinking melodically, and it's very hard to not, you know, there are things that sound beautiful to you. And so those, some of the same shapes are going to come back. And if you, you know, you have your favorite artists and that's partly why you like it is because it's got the same shapes that come back now and again. Call it a reference. We're going to say that we're, we're referring to a previous work, which is a very great thing to do. It's a bit of an Easter egg. It's just like a fun little phrase. I love that. Thank you. Because that it's got to be now is such a beautiful line in Manny's the time. And then going into the pipe solo. Last question then about this one. The combination, I was trying to figure out what level of vitriol is in the lyrics as compared to this. I don't want to say dance party, but it's got these jokey, you know, we've talked about it's a very chaotic song. So I don't know. Do you think about how the tone of this seems like a very light Two layers of irony, social commentary, something like that, <laughs> combined with this thing. I don't know. Do you feel like, oh, wow, you know what? Yeah, we're about to, to get into the guilty and the innocent, which also is a sort of a, yes, it's social commentary, but it's kind of, it's, it's sitting back. It's observational. It's, you know, of how that's going to interact with, in this case, your Dionysian <laughs> revel versus in the guilty and the innocent, which is just a beautiful acoustic strum thing, you know, but it's actually, a similar level of snarkiness to the lyrics. They're not like, you bastards. And they're not happy songs. Yeah, because it sounds like a rock party, the happiness index. The title even looks like it. But it's actually, it's got a lot of that UK kind of, we're going to tell you how this is. We're going to have a good time, but it's kind of a rough time as well. We're going to get this off our minds. And it's talking about quite gentle things like the King of Bhutan. It's like that empowering thing of we're taking back control of the stats. That's a good line. That's great. I'm going to take back control here. We're going to be really positive about it. We're not just going to complain about stuff. We're saying we've got the power ourselves and uh, the clowns would do a better job of looking after the circus. Like, of course, we could, we can do it ourselves if we want to. Well, that's why I didn't know if that part was irony that. Of course, redescribing something is not actually changing anyone's real level of happiness. So, because that's where if you can get on your feet and feel it, and it's very empowering to play that song extremely loudly and to thrash your guitars, that's the kind of thing you've got to party through the chaos, really. I mean, that's a lot of UK thing. I mean, nobody's been happy at the situation for. Ever whistling round the graveyard, raving round the graveyard, or something. I know that's the history of British music, really. Not that I'm British, <laughs> but uh, in Ireland's different. It's kind of slightly different, but there is always a Dionysian aspect to Irish music for sure. It's a powerful statement. Music is a statement of our culture and our attitude to everything, really. All right, let's introduce the guilty and the innocent. So, a couple albums ago. The album's called The Guilty and the Innocent 2017. Rose, your representative, had said this was an album you were particularly excited about. There's a lot of stuff in the album from the news. I don't know if I picked the one that she had in mind for that, but I liked this model and actually both the second and the third song that we're going to talk about. Maybe we'll talk at 
less length because the songs themselves are quite long by themselves that show that, yes, you are a writer. I'm holding your book here, 21st Century Troubadour, which is a travelogue, Mm. which most rock biographies I can just cruise through that it's, you know, pretty much, oh, yes, here was my ramp up to when I was famous. And here's how we lost our record deal. And then here's 10 pages covering the last 25 years after. And this is not that book at all. (laughs) This is a writer doing a writer's thing, giving beautiful descriptions of whatever hotel and bar debacle you are in at the moment. Can you say a little about the song, The Guilty and the Innocent, and this project, where you were at at this point, 2017? Yeah, when I started off, a lot of what I was writing was really happening all around me in Belfast in the 80s and 90s. And I hadn't really written a political album for quite a long time. I'd separated out what I did, not consciously, but if I look at poems I wrote, started writing around that time, I kind of kept more political matters in personal sphere, like just writing poetry, prose. My songs, I was really traveling the world and I was, they were more emotional, individual. And 2017 happened. I had a big, something huge happened in my emotional life. And I really, I just started watching the news again and really getting into the kind of thinking I had when I was young, where I was really connected to what was happening outside. And a whole series of events started to happen in Britain. And I wrote songs about each of those things. I remember there was a bombing in the arena in Manchester, where lots and lots of kids were killed at an Ariana Grande concert by a suicide bomber. And you'd have to check that. I'm not sure. I th- I'm pretty sure it was. And I remember writing a song just instinctively, not thinking I'm going to write a song, but I reacted the same way as it did. Because I, I felt the community's pain that they were going through from my childhood in Belfast when like randomly people would be blown up every day or every other day for whatever reason. It didn't matter. It was the pain of the people who were suffering, which was the most impactful thing. And that happened. After that Manchester bombing, I remember I actually sent it to Peter Gabriel, if you want to see segue into this. And he said, yeah, keep going, put that out. He actually said, get somebody to sing it, a particular person. But anyway, I put it out. I started putting things up on SoundCloud, which meant I didn't have to release them. I just put them up. I put out a song called Dignity, which was about the Australian government. has got a really bad policy towards asylum seekers. And Australia's made up of people who have arrived here since the indigenous population who've been here for 65,000 years had to put up with people arriving since, you know, 17 something and were very unwelcoming to asylum seekers. So I, I wrote a song called Dignity about that. So it was like I was starting to write about what was going on. I was shocked by a big tower block in London, in the very richest part of London, burnt down. And it was full of very low income people. It was in the richest part of London, but it was packed full of immigrants and people with hardly any money. And it burnt down and there were no fire precautions and loads of people died. And if anybody goes to West London or you look a picture of West London now, it's like a shell of a blackened shell standing in the middle of the richest bit of London, very close to Kensington Palace. Uh, It's now shrouded in white, so it looks like a massive gravestone. And that was called Grenfell Tower. And I wrote a couple of songs about, well, I wrote a song called Age Old Story about that. I wrote, I heard Chuck Schumer say, this is not a television show on the TV. And I wrote a song called that because I was, couldn't believe what was happening in American politics and British ones. So I started to write songs about what was going on. Like they were like broadsheet ballads. It's like, in centuries ago, people would write songs and wander around. Troubadours would run, wander around telling the news through songs. And that's what I was doing. And when I'd done about 10 of those, it's a very long introduction, but it's a, <laughs> a very deep song. And I realized that I wanted to write a song which didn't judge the guilty and the innocent because you can't line everybody up and say, you're guilty and we are innocent because we're all guilty and we're all innocent as well. So I wanted to stand back and be more objective about it and have one song on the record which really summed up everything that had gone before, all these specific songs. I wanted one to be objective. 
And I just got that feeling of, I don't know what the right word is. It's not ennui. It's like sometimes you just feel the world is such a beautiful place and we're absolutely wrecking it as a human race. Any idea about how badly we're fucking it up? But also the beauty that we've managed to create. I think you're referring to the uh, Finnish word stingflas. Which no, I'm. I don't know what if there's a if there's a poetic oh, term for that. Well, after that last one about the song, <laughs> I, I'm going to believe you. Ah, right. Stingflas. Yeah, but that, we just we just coined that, it right now. There you go. That wisdom. That stingflas. Something feeling. have something to do with sting. I don't know. I wrote four, three verses. If you're being really analytic about the song, it goes back to the first: the, the guilty and the innocent will see me on the same side. It actually goes back, and that's how long the song was. It was very short. And then I started writing more verses. And I've always been, I've always loved those really long songs like Hello Lady of the Lowlands, brilliant. Desolation Row, obviously. Recently, because I was inspired as well by hearing Divine Comedy by Father John Misty. I mean, isn't just the English ballad form that you could just put more and more verses or, you know, the historical ballad oh, for a folk song it's not long like i remember thinking how many verses is this oh it's got 11 verses for a folk song an irish folk song that's a single like it could have 45 verses i listened to divine comedy by father john misty i thought it was beautiful it tried to look at everything and in kind of ironic way it was fantastic track i hadn't listened to an album track and been as excited by that for ages so i just dived back into that world which first excited me when i wrote things where the hunchback of Notre Dame is in Desolation Row and he's there with Cinderella and Shakespeare. Like it's Shakespeare's in the Alley and another Bob Dylan songs. I just love that vernacular thing of having the past and the present all happening at the same time. The guilty and the innocent will soon be on the same side. They went out walking. Down to the great divide To meet all of us who are restless And don't know which way to turn After all this philosophy Still got a lot to learn The guilty and the innocent Being on a religious ride How's that working out for you? I heard too many people have died It's a medieval painting Faces contorted in pain Either that or a demonstration To give equality another name The guilty and the innocent We'll soon be on the same side When the stars come crashing from the sky Into that great divide And the undertaker's laughing He got a message on his phone There's a dog playing piano And a cat chewing on a bone The guilty and the innocent Have found a new place to hide Right beside the temple Dedicated to Frankenstein's bride You can worship who you want to The auction ends at ten Michelangelo retired early to study his motorcycles and The guilty and the innocent With their eyes open wide Tried to work out in the dark Who it was who lied And a fully furnished garbage truck Collects evidence for the trial while the anxiety surges Express the secrets of the night 
the guilty and the innocent Standing in Canute's title The president and all his men A garden number on the inside And Marilyn walks by In a swimsuit of Virgin Mary Blue We've seen this movie before Everything except the ending is new The guilty and the innocent And the LGBTQI At 45 RPM The revolution is open wide You asked me for a road map And I offered you a link Where you can download salvation And buy us all a better drink The guilty and the innocent It cannot be denied They look a lot like you and me When we're standing at the graveside And the justice slams his gavel Wherever roses bloom Jesus himself is breaking bread On the dark side of this room The guilty and the innocent Got the book of revelation by their side They're looking through a one-way mirror But they're standing on the same side The astronaut cannot be bored He's seen things from afar The world is hanging fragile Like a floating glass bell jar The guilty and the innocent Are the same as you and me With Nelson's eye on the horizon Experience comes too easily Nothing comes from nothing And everything comes to an end No direction home Home is where the hurt can mend Nothing comes from nothing And everything comes to an end The only direction is home Home is where the hurt can mend Home is where the hurt can mend So how are we deciding when we have this many verses? Did you do this with a live band such that they could sort of feel it out? Or, you know, that you have occasional things. Okay, now the bass is going to, you're going to actually hear the bass. It's going to fly up an octave. It's going to play a few notes. But for the most part, you've got at least the same players. I'm trying to remember. No, yeah, you, you add piano. Actually, the first few verses, there's some sort of layering. Every single, every single verse, something new happens. Even if it's the piano is playing higher. Or something, but how much, yeah, how much were you directing this one to make sure that would happen? Or would you just leave it to the musicians to figure out what made sense? Well, there's so much variation, Mark, in the lyrics. The lyrics never, they're changing all the time. So really the musical thing is, yeah, just to have a little something will pop out and then come back again. But we don't really need the music to describe stuff because... There's so much description in the lyrics. So the music is the place it lives and it grooves and that's it. It doesn't need to do things and it definitely doesn't need to be descriptive. Noticing even in the lyrics themselves, I mean, is this just because like you have a page of lyrics and then you go to sing it against this thing and you're sort of deciding 
Jesus himself is breaking bread. Okay, of that one, I'm going to do everything on the beat. But then the world is hanging fragile like a bloating, you know, that you're going to do offbeat for every word on the next one. Is that even plant? Like if you sang it twice in a row, would those same things necessarily happen? Not in the same way, no. The different takes of the guilty and innocent, it's always going to be different. It'll never be the same. But the emphasis, I would be going for the same emphasis because in my head, the phrase has got its meter like that, like you've just said. I would be going for that, but I mightn't always get it because I try and record those songs. First, I'm reading them and then sometimes I'm not reading them because reading them, the emphasis comes out differently. But I'll probably have written that not on the page. It depends. Not quite sure if I wrote some of the guilty and innocent on the page and some of it I was just, I was making it up and letting the images flow out. Because a lot of the time, if you get in the right zone or the right place, then those images will just come out. And that's why it's not a logical narrative for sure, but it does have a narrative progression. I can see the story, how it evolves. Well, especially the end, that nothing comes from nothing. The fact that you do that twice, this whole nothing comes from nothing and everything comes to an end, no direction home. home that's, is from, really you know where that's, from. that's from King Lear. Oh, all right. Nothing comes from nothing. It's like a phrase people would say, it's, but, and you're not sure if it came from Shakespeare or I think there's a Latin phrase which that comes from. Oh, so it's just that line. It's not the whole home is where the hurt can mend or something. Okay, all right. I, I was thinking that. It's just nothing comes from nothing. It's not like a manifesto as well, because a lot of the other songs really say exactly what I think about things. But the guilty in this sense, returning to the state where this is the way it is. I'm telling it the way it is. This is the story. This is how I see it right now. But I'm not telling you what. Very metaphorically. You can't say this is the way it is. That Jesus himself is breaking bread on the dark side of this room. Like, I'm not even sure what that means. Not that you have to decode your poetry here, but. No, it's interesting because every time I sing it, I think it's a very startling thought for me. I've played that in a lot of places, imagining Jesus is somewhere in the room, like just breaking bread, like what's he doing? It's um, wondering what's going on here. What's all this about? Or while the anxiety surgeons express the secrets of the Nile, as opposed to like the fully furnished garbage truck collects evidence for the trial, like that all sounds you know, very applicable to current politics or something. But then I wasn't sure what the anxiety, again, I don't want to demean your poetry by saying, explain this line, but is that something that has to you a clear meaning? What the anxiety surgeons and what the secrets of the Nile, how that contrasts. Anxiety surgeons, people taking apart, psychiatrists taking apart your mental state, like surgeons. And there's something about denial in it. There's something about... Oh, I see. Denial. And denial and denial. Sure. The secrets of denial. Did I write it out? Did I type it out as denial or denial? I can't remember. You know, I can't remember with this one if I just got it, if I just transcribed it or if I got it somewhere. I might have, I might have gotten this wrong. You know, secrets of denial, people going off on a boat, like in an Agatha Christie book and there's like the Sphinx and everything in the pyramids. Oh, we understand these things. Do we understand them? Probably not be hard to take apart all that stuff like there's so much richness in human history and thought and action that we don't understand as far as that having that home is where the hurt can mend like that sounds like an end of the song but then you decided to we're going to put the solo we're going to do the same thing again do you remember what your thought was on the song is not long enough as opposed to just like having the harmonica come and fade it out like do you remember what Wow. Well, that's classic ballad. You go right in this whole story, boom, and then you have a harmonica solo where you don't need any more words. You've had all the words, but then that's not the end because there's something you want to come back to because you've gone through so many things. You want to repeat it. And one of the lines says, uh, no direction home. And then it comes back to home is where the hurt can mend. So it was like, it develops the verse, which was just before the harmonica solo. It changes slightly. And then it says, home is where the hurt can mend. And you think, okay, that's where we're, we're getting to. Like, you've got to really get home to where you came from to try to get back to what's really important. And then that is such a big deal that there's a tiny harmonica solo. And then you, I just want to say it again. So it's like a tag at the end because there is no chorus in this song. 
And the title of the song, and the only thing which repeats is the first line of every verse, which is unusual. That's like a folk thing where you don't work up to, like even Tangled Up in Blue or Destination really ends up with the title, but this is the other way around, where the only thing that it repeats is the first line, which is more like a, an ancient poem would be. So some of this is pretty straightforward. I mean, I, I take back my assessment of this being sort of the same level of irony or the same tone in any way as the previous song, because this is definitely a more serious thing that you're talking about. You're using phrases like faces contorted in pain. You know, you're not saying, as in the next song, Speechless, where toward the end, it's African baby dying. Like it's, it's very vivid and bombs, you know, but here, you know, so much of it is more metaphorical or, you know, there's a dog playing piano and a cat chewing on a bone, which is not, it's not amusing ourselves to death. It's what a weird, what a mad, mad, mad world or something, you know, some general befuddlement as opposed to what a bunch of uh, hypocrites we are for every single stanza. Yeah. And there's real contemporary stuff mixed in with ancient poetry and stuff. There's a whole, like I've, I've always been very excited by things like the wasteland where all of human time is ha- happening at the same time. Like all of history is always happening and it's happening right now. Kay Tempest, I don't know if you've ever listened to them, an English poet, writer and performer has a thing called Brand New Ancients, which is like the kind of that same thing where everything is happening at the time. So you're in the supermarket and there's like a Greek a hero from Greek mythology in the supermarket. That kind of thing is always really excited me. And we're looking at our phones while all this stuff's going on. The world is in crisis and we're looking at dogs, dogs on phones playing pianos like it's and it's not making judgment on those things. And that's the big thing about the guilty and the innocent is we're not judging anything. This is just the way. But this is the way it is. This is what we're talking about. Well, now you got me thinking. So if, if it's sort of a, it's almost a, a suspension of time, but that's something that one could, and you probably have in your catalog, be very literal about with the music. Whereas this, yes, it's repeating. And you could see that as a suspension of time and like, you know, Sisyphus pushing the rock up, some, some kind of repetitive task that could, this could go on forever. This song could, you know, it doesn't have a place, unlike Speechless, where the drums kick in, you know, where there's some major shift in tone. It's just that it does get gentle toward the end. But other than that, does the, the fact that the music repeats like that connect up to this idea of all history existing at the same time? It's a very good point. I've never thought of it before. It just, the music just needed to stop and sound like it sounds and then stop it's not, and things would come out of the mix at some points but that wasn't a big it was all about the words the guilty and the innocent I mean it's really all about the words and the atmosphere the idea that this could have 11 verses but it could have 27 verses as well as opposed to something with five verses where which is still long but you could have more of an excuse to And now we're going to do the slower verse or, you know, something that, no, no, it has to just stay, keep that momentum going. You know, the acoustic guitar is like the train keep on running. Is there any percussion that eventually comes in here on this? I thought maybe I heard some bongos, but maybe it was just tapping on the guitar. That's a good idea. Bit of a beat (laughs) bongo player in the corner, like Johnny Staccato. But there is a good point that it doesn't have as much power if you only play like the first five verses, it's impossible to do. It gains momentum by repeating. You can really feel that in a concert setting. Like I'm sure I'll put out a live version of it at some point because the guilty and innocent really comes alive in front of people because people realize, ah, okay, this isn't going to end this song and it's not going to change very much except for the words, which are changing all the time. We can kind of relax, but we can't really relax because everything's changing all the time. And it becomes more and more powerful when people just give in to the fact, we're just going to go with this. And I've tried to play it like when, if you're doing a radio interview, and it has to be like the clock, has to, you have to finish by the time the clock gets to the top. And I've tried to cut verses and it's just unsatisfying to play some of it. I just can't really do that. I tried to, I did that a couple of times on radio and it just doesn't work. Well, this sounds like a wonderful way to segue to our third song, Speechless. We're going to play the version from the original version from 1992's Out There. Again, an album that your representative said that you were particularly enamored with and pointed out this song in particular. 
But then, of course, you have a live version that's on the WOMAD recorded speechless live album where you cut out a few verses. Good link. I didn't remember remember that. Yeah, that's true. I cut out some verses at the end. Yes. But I know so, why I did I kinda know where I did, why I did that. Well it's it's two sections. So the first the first big chunk of it is a travelogue where it seems like you go through the entire tour. You know, the tour is a little faster in the other version. It's a nice just five minute song or five and a half or something, but then it takes a hard right turn into I don't know, maybe we shouldn't spoil it for people and make them sit through to get to it, but two major things which left me completely speechless. The tour of America, my first tour, not the first time I'd been in America, but the first time I'd really toured across America in a bus. And the second thing, well, people will understand that it was the Gulf War, which happened in the early 90s. Any other thoughts just about sort of where you were at with this album back then, recording? Yeah, there was such an exciting record for me. The previous record was called Himself, and I recorded it in the countryside in Northern Ireland and just going right back to having been on a big record company, going back to uh, an independent company, just having to make ends meet and record as cheaply as possible. And himself is really beautiful record. I love it. It was it's a record about home and being back in Ireland. And I recorded most of it live very quickly. And it's got amazing atmosphere on it. Just the sounds and the way the songs go together is just so attractive to me. Well, ironically enough, Warner's really liked himself and they asked if that, you know, I would do the next record with them. So suddenly I'm back on a big record company. But this one tells me you do exactly what you like. Now, because himself was put out by this independent company called Cooking Vinyl, who had in each country in Europe and in America, but definitely in Europe, they had a different company who would really concentrate on the releases. Because if you're on a big company, and I was on Polygram before, because you're never going to sell as many records as Dire Straits or it's like some huge art, it'll go out to all the countries in Europe and some of them will like it and you'll go over and do something. But they just get some good reviews. That's nice. They won't necessarily invite you to the country. But with Cooking Vinyl, because it was quite a big deal when himself came out in all those countries when I'd previously been on Polygram, so everybody knew my records, especially the first one. Like, the first one was on MCA in America, which was wonderful. So, like, loads of it went out all across America, which was very exciting. Anyway, because the independent companies across Europe were so careful, they invited me to go and tour in the different countries. And the touring led to the experiences which really are written up on Out There, the next record which Warner's put out. And that time in Europe was a very big deal because everything was changing. There were revolutions in Europe. The Berlin Wall was coming down. I played in East Berlin between the wall coming down and Germany being united. I toured in what was Czechoslovakia after the Velvet Revolution. And I toured with a group of students who'd been integral to the Velvet Revolution. And the story of how that happened is just Incredible. The students' role in the Velvet Revolution was huge. So the Eastern Europe was opening up, went to Spain and had this amazing experience in Spain. There's a song called The Color of Love, which is beautiful on, on that record. So all these, these tracks are narratives. I was able to do exactly what I liked because the record company just went, we believe in you, you do what you want. And all the songs are very long. So speechless describes the story of a tour I did in America opening up for Hot House Flowers uh, on the bus. I wrote it like a beat poem. Like I've always loved beat poetry. I loved on the road when I was a kid. And I realized when I got to America and was actually driving across America in a bus, that's on the road. Because it's so incredible that, you know, 16-year-olds all across the world read on the road and get the vibe, they get the feeling get the rhythm, get the beauty of being out there. But when you actually go to America and you experience some of it, it's 3D suddenly. It just opens it all out. And that's what Speechless is about. It just left me speechless, the experience of being in all those beautiful cities, having such an exciting time, and then coming back home and 
I just knew that was such a bad idea to go into the Middle East like that. And it was always going to have never going to work out. It was going to be, it was a really, really huge thing. Just the images of the killing and the violence which went on in the Middle East and the effect that was obviously going to have on the soldiers who were there as well as the people who were there. It's not the soldiers themselves, it's the decisions which are made on their behalf, which are just disastrous. And it was always going to be really bad. And it was like America, this is America. Okay, this is also America. This is also the UK and all the people who lined up behind them to to kill. And that left me speechless. And I just watched Apocalypse Now. That's why the whole of the second section is written sort of from the point of view of going into the heart of darkness, because I thought that war was really going into the heart of darkness. And humanity, as in the guilty and innocent, humanity doesn't really learn from what happened before. Everybody thinks we're so clever about history, but we just do not learn from history and keep just doing it again. I really felt we were doing it again. And just a warning to the listener, when you do go in the heart of darkness, there is didgeridoo there. So watch out. Exactly. (laughs) Well, that supports the low essentials. Yeah, of course, because thanks for reminding me. Yeah, Liam plays a didgeridoo in total respect for its traditions, its ancient traditions. And that, again, that kind of sound, if humans listened and paid more attention to these ancient sounds, which we've made for thousands of years, maybe we'd do things a little better. In Montreal, where Europe meets America, I saw Leonard Cohen's house, and that was good. And since it was the festival, there were jazz bands playing on the street corners, like I knew they always would. And the surrogate sister, she took me in her arms and said, Hey Andy, welcome to the new world. I was speechless. Speechless. In Toronto, there's the longest street in the world. And I wanted to find a place called the Beat Bookshop. I went in to buy a 25 cents trash novel. It was called Stranger in Our Midst. Round the corner in an electrical store An old man looked me in the eye Said, son, you look speechless Speechless In Boston, where everybody wears red socks I met some lost and lonesome Irish boys They thought if they left home fast enough They could find their own voice But as the ship sailed out into the harbour Flower music playing I saw their homeland in their eyes And I was speechless Speechless In Philadelphia and Washington DC The driving seat of this whole big country I saw the endless horizons parceled up real neat And delivered as a skyscraper in a street And the homeless queue outside the White House for food And the black guy selling matchsticks in the hotel lobby Left me speechless New York heat hit me late one night Going down to the convenience store with Big Stevie for a beer Summon a boy, the subway steam And the way cigarettes never taste the way they do round here And the guy playing a drum kit in the back of a hip-hop bus And the rapper son of 6th Avenue and 13th Street Left me speechless I said speechless Rain swept the orange boxes on the Chicago street A bright shiny city all covered in lights And a clean girl from the Midwest Told me it's so good they don't need to name it twice And the second city wind blew from across the lake I had a bottle of wine outside for Bobby's sake And I was speechless Speechless San Francisco stretches itself out on the side of a hill with white walled houses and open top mines That night we played a gig of slims There were crazy hitchhikers, a ballerina and wheelchair Jana Me and a bunch of flowers, staying up late Not a mile from the Golden Gate By the morning we were speechless We were all speechless An old railroad diner at an Italian restaurant out of Santa Monica Driving a Pontiac Firebird right hand side the gunshots, the glitter and the grease paint Cruising Beverly Hills and North Maple Leaf Drive Suddenly she showed up and her shoulders Now Elizabeth Taylor look I thought I'd read the answers Now I'd thrown away the book I was speechless Speechless The time we hit Texas Our 
Irish skin was nearly fried And we saw the faceless place where in 1963 They said America died Me and Liam in a diner They thought our accents were outrageous Even though we were speechless Speechless Last stop was Atlanta So, so deep in the south The sky was gliding over And the music came tumbling up The phone rang like something from a cable movie scene Calling me home from that American dream Speechless 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 In the airport lobby Speechless My life on a joy Speechless I let the mic through Speechless Like the letters I never wrote The night came dark The moon turned black the rain fell up and the wind blew back I was speechless Speechless The night came dark The moon turned black The rain fell up and the wind blew back I was speechless 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 yeah. Speechless Just now I saw the bloated belly of a starving child Matchstick arms and an old man's eyes He'd watched his family slowly die Sitting on a skull too weak to cry In some forgotten corner of Africa They said foreign aid was dropping because of the war I was speechless Watching TV till late tonight Since the bulbs were gone It was by candlelight The room was dark The moon turned black The rain fell up and the wind blew back Every ten minutes Flashing on the screen Were the bloody banners Of the American war machine I was speechless the president pleading, support the war Won't somebody tell me what we were fighting it for Speechless The horror The horror still hasn't got through To command posts Where generals suck pencils and order steak And where TV crews on leave play cards the ship of hope is still moored in its harbour While we set sail as Willard's crew Into darkness Headed for its terrible heart And the horror now so easily attainable Did no one die in Flandersville? Or not enough at Agincourt? Were there too many people left alive in Dresden For blessed memory to forget? Take us now and take our young men down into the deep Where young men before them Have suffered and died Dreaming of their mothers And a better life back home Take us now For another late 20th century sacrifice We've seen before Those horrified faces Still stare out of backwoods forests In the USA Lost forever in the horror Maybe in years to come Gulf survivors will stop the deserts Seeing dead comrades' ghosts amidst the burning sands So it's all aboard Willard's ship All aboard And no one screaming stop And no one chooses to remember the horror For we are the hollow men Our heads stuffed with straw The light fades Till we're deep in the darkness and we drop The light fades Till we're deep in the darkness and we drop Speechless Speechless And so this is also a very long song but it sounds like you're playing it more or less live with a band or was this just all layered bit by bit? 
like the other no, one? No, this is pretty much live. And uh, I love the drum. The drummer has just waited so long to come in. That's yeah. really good. Yes. So that provides a marker. Also, I was wondering, you know, the first time the sax line comes in, da, 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 and I'm like, why is it so quiet? Why is it so well, so, so it has somewhere to go that by the time it happens the fourth time, yeah, the first time I wasn't even really sure, like, is this just a guitar noodling in there? What guided your choice of, I mean, I guess it's sort of for the first half, aside from, I guess, some Ebo stuff, but kind of the Bob Dylan in his full band period, you know, you got an organ, you got these timeless, you've referred to it elsewhere, timeless instruments. Timeless instruments. We love timeless instruments. Sometimes on records, somebody comes into the session, we've just discovered digital strings and then everybody puts digital strings on the record and then 10 years later it's like oh that was a pity about the digital <laughs> strings which everybody was really excited about and in the end if it's classic if the words are great i knew from the first record which has got a sampler on it but we used the sampler in a really unusual way and it's still i'm really pleased we used we sampled like kids voices we sampled saxophones we sampled things and used them in an unusual way but it doesn't really, the classic lineup is one which I was still using on that record. That was the fourth record. Yeah, just great musicians. And Rod, who plays the Hammond and saxophone, until like the latest record, like most people, most songwriters are, have somebody or they have a band they meet when they're very young. And Rod and I were in school together. And that kind of bond, which goes on through the years, is very important. And like the Hammond is, is his thing. Piano is his, though he doesn't play, like Liam plays piano on this record. And uh, so it's a mixture of just a live band. And I guess the most remarkable about, thing about it was Liam's vocal, which is really just reacting in real time to the song as it goes through. And he started off with that. Shh. He just started off with the wind at the start and he ended up playing the, with the didgeridoo at the end. It was all just a live take. It's fantastic. And do you have multiple women also doing these? Whoa, that's all Liam. Okay. All right. Yeah. He's an amazing singer. He's like an incredible singer. Yeah. Okay. So this sounds very much. So a text like this, are you peeking at it or is it just come out in one stream? This one I would have written. Written and picked at for six months or written and there it's done. Well, in classic beat style. So Kerouac would write the on, on the road in one sitting, maybe, but he knew enough about French novels to go back and and really edit it totally. And I, that's what I would do. I would write it all out as quickly as possible, and then I, I would edit it afterwards. There'd be some room for improvisation. So there are lists, a lot of lists. There's like ballerinas and hitchhikers and wheelchair Jana and you know, those things might just come out as a improvisation in one take and that, then you keep it because it's the real. Sure. It's like you're a stand-up comedian who, you know, the jokes are written, but they're going to be a little different delivery every time. But I would, I would want to get the lyrics of that right. And the guilty and the innocent as well. You'd have to do it again. Like you'd have to take it again. Or if the words weren't right, I would never have any line on a record I wasn't happy with. Like I would really would not. That's not going to happen. So if it's an improvisation, it's got to be really good. Have your sensibilities changed over time? I mean, there's a lot of lyrics in here. I would be surprised if there wasn't some line in here that you're just like, I would do that a little differently now. And probably you do do that a little differently now if you play this live. Or are they, were you such a high quality control at the time that, no, 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 it's fine. This is what I wrote. This is what I lived at the time. I was telling the truth then. It's still the truth. I don't feel, need to feel embarrassed about anything. No, I like that way of looking at it. Because you're right, it's the truth as it was on the time. And then when I would have redone it for the Speechless album, it wasn't just because somebody said, make it shorter. It was probably because that bit of the story by the time, it, I think for me, I thought later on that the story really ended in Atlanta when somebody called me up and said, you got to come home now. That's kind of the end of the story. So I thought I was going on to, I think it went to Los Angeles at the end, and I thought that was too much, so I just cut it out. I think you end with Texas both times, but there was like some California stuff in between that was gone. Yeah, I think I took California out because it didn't quite, it just wasn't good enough, the thing. And I could, sometimes in songs, you can remember the exact 
things that they're about and it's better not to sometimes and in that one it wasn't it was better not to and then you also cut down the war part yeah because it was about 10 years after the war i just tried to look at the core of what i was talking about which really is the famine in africa and the massive amounts of money being spent on a war to solidify oil production like it's just a I, I, you know I didn't write down whether for instance did no one die in Flanders Field or not enough at Anju were there not too many people yes actually I I remember now because I only had the lyrics written for the shorter version so the other ones I had to try to figure out what you were saying I thought was a really good line <laughs> in there were there too many people left alive in Dresden for blessed memory to forget but I that's a good line but then you added in the same now as it was then as you know I'm going to replace three verses with that one line and then go straight to the hollow men thing, well, you know, which has a, a literary pedigree there, the hollow man. Yeah, there's usually something from T.S. Eliot and something from Shakespeare on nearly all the records. There's definitely a Nick is Shakespeare line every single time. Come on, guys. Let's pay respect to the tradition. But that's really good. I'm so glad you've done that bit of analysis there. Because that Flanders field, that, that, those, are, those are good. And Ashenkur, like, let's get it wrong again, guys. Well, I, I love this, even just the touring part. I'll admit that I like the first half. Yeah. <laughs> the touring part is such a nice song that, like, it could have just stopped there. in some settings. Maybe if you're trying, if it's not supposed to be a bummer, you know, and it is kind of a different. What was your thought in putting those together? I mean, other than these were two things that left me speechless. That was the connection. Because I think places like, especially like, you just can't generalize about places like, what was America like? It's amazing. Your country is, it's a great idea. It's beautiful. You meet the most fantastic people there. And then simultaneously is wrecking the place. Okay. So it was specifically connected to America as opposed to. You like humanity is the most amazing, wonderful thing, creative and generous and kind and clever and inspired. And then just completely fucks itself up by what by its actions as well. So I guess speechless really is just looking at both of those things instead of just one of those things. As opposed to, wow, I went on this, I had this really ex- life-changing experience and here's my scrapbook from it. But by comparison, you feel guilty. What am I doing with my life? I'm not imposing this on you. This is just how I was reading this juxtaposition of, I hope you weren't trying to undermine the first half in terms of your experience by the second half that, wow, you know, I thought this was very cool, but like people are actually dying. You know, that's a good way to put a damper on or to existentially reevaluate what you thought was such a important experience. That's great analysis, Mark. I mean, both things are completely valid. And one is my individual experience. And the other one is like observed experience as well. For me, one doesn't undermine the other, both things. It's like, like it ties into the guilty and the innocent. Nice comparison there because both things exist at the same time to get we're both we're all guilty and we're all innocent as well i should be campaigning for the referendum in australia today and i will i promise myself i will i'm not doing it i'm not doing it now and i (laughs) probably should be (laughs) and it's not just america it's like britain has got the most fantastic people in it it's the most it's like so many ideas and the most left-wing people, intellectuals, great people, great working people, and just appalling governments, and like everything's falling apart, and it's a nightmare. And Ireland's so beautiful and creative and has such a history of emotion and power and in, in an artistic sense. And we killed each other for years, like spent lots and lots of time murdering each other. That's true. So all these things exist at the same time, and I guess I'm just trying to have an individual's viewpoint on all that. Because I've found myself, when artists approach these kinds of things, that it's very enlightening and exciting, as well as being thoughtful. Your style seems of social commentary, even though it's you know very present. There's a lot of political songs you've got, um, but it seems quite different than, say, Billy Bragg, label mate, uh, one-time label mate, who seems much more direct I could sing this at a rally. I don't see many of your songs. Maybe we just didn't pick the right songs for doing at a rally, for instance. No, because when I was young, if you lined up on that side 
or that side. And Billy very, and I respect him for doing it, he lines up on that side, on one side. But when I was growing up, both sides were really bad. Like, all we wanted to do was give peace a chance. If you sang rebel songs, if you sang songs from the other point of view, you were just part of the problem. What I was and the people who grew up at the same time as me, we just wanted to give peace a chance. I heard give peace a chance on the radio. It was actually as the soundtrack of a documentary on TV. And it blew my mind because somebody was just saying what I believed in, give peace a chance. You know, John Lennon's always been the king, really. And uh, we just should listen to him <laughs> and uh, obey, give peace a chance. And that was my whole thing. So that continued on and on. Whereas sometimes I don't take a side like that because you've got to look at both sides and express an individual point of view. And like Billy would be, Billy's amazing, but he's not a poet. Like I'm a poet. I write, but like I use imagery and narrative in a, in a different way from him, though I totally respect the way he does it. And his clarity is incredible. He's got a role. His role is like that, that manager, Peter, told him that the UK needed a Woody Guthrie. It needed Woody Guthrie. Such was the prime minister and it needed a political folk singer. And that's what he did. And he continues to do it to this day. It's amazing. So that was his role. Whereas my role would be like a minor poet. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> but it's cool because cultural society needs all types. Sure. He's from a place where right and wrong, left and right, were very clear and definitely right, as in um, correct, like was definitely the left, the left wing, for sure. Whereas uh, we didn't even have a, there's not even a party you could align yourself with in Northern Ireland, which was left wing. At that time, it was just a sectarian division between this side or that side. To close this out, let's introduce the last song that I had on the list. So we're just going to introduce it and then we'll be done. It'll play. We will not come oh, back. Oh, great. Uh, I forgot which about is the last one. Which was the last Italian one? Girls on Mopeds I picked from Boy 40, 2003, because it is just one of the sonically most beautiful things, right? This is using your 12 string. And there are a number of songs, despite the ones that I picked here, that are much dumber, just in terms of like not as many words per minute and just like, let's get a good phrase and repeat it over, you know, that you've written so many songs. So this is one, I'm not dismissing the lyrics as a whole or anything, but it's not the main appeal. It's coming from a different place. You want to say where you're at in this intervening period, 2003, and, and this song before we say goodbye here. Oh, damn rock songs. There's lots of them on the record. <laughs> as well. That's why that record we were talking about ends up with a song called Na 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 Na, because <laughs> there's nothing much else to say. So I love, like, there's one called No Way Out. I love dumb rock songs as well. And Italian Girls and Mopeds is a special one because it's sonically, yeah, the, thank you for reminding me. It's very air. It's got air and beauty. And it's just, I was a young Irishman arriving in Palermo in Sicily, looking out the window, hoping to maybe see one or two beautiful Italian girls, you know, like in a 60s movie. And I looked out the window and there was like 45 of them just running a red light with no helmets on their hair blowing in the breeze it was beautiful and i mean the whole song is a metaphor about feeling young like if you go back to italy it'll still look like that like in 15 years time it'll still look like that it's like there was a particular period in english american culture where we were for some reason exposed to more italy back in the late 60s and so that is still the image that we have this yeah but it's still like that mark if you go there tomorrow <laughs> That's what it's like. That's some things are timeless. So it was probably like that in the 40s. It's just that, okay. <laughs> They'll never stop and ask you to marry them. It'll just, it's just a beautiful experience. It's just a beautiful thing. And you can feel part of that. And that's what the song's about. Italian girls, it's, they are timeless. Well, thanks so much for sharing your stories and your, your music here. Uh, it was a great pleasure. Great pleasure for me as well, Mark. Thank you for the amount of thought and imagination you put into listening to the songs because there's so much in them and it's very nice to talk to, to somebody who's looked at that well i'll have links to the the at album and uh want to especially if you liked hearing andy talk this podcast is only temporary where he is right now going through every song and now i hope i have 
I've influenced, I have perhaps ruined the happiness index for you. So when you have to do that one, you'll be like, oh, I already said this. I don't even No, but you no. give me some gold. <laughs> you know, if I had the patience and the budget to not only just put the songs in, but to like have them playing in the background constantly as we go and different el- like you just put so much love and care into you know, and multi-track, let's say that uh, that's, that's, the, that's the missing element that I don't bother. That's with nice because I've got the multi-track so I can <laughs> look at those things. And it's, yeah, it's a precious thing. And I, I guess I was inspired by, there's a brilliant YouTube film of, from a BBC documentary of Tony Visconti going through Heroes. Mm-hmm. And that really inspired me because if you listen to the constituent parts of Heroes, it's so exciting. And you know what? It's not very complicated. And, you know, I grew up listening to Heroes just as a thing. I didn't know what all the bits did. It's just like a sound. Like when I listened to ABBA when I was a kid, it just is a noise and it's beautiful. But I don't know the bits of it. I don't know the bass is doing this or the drums are doing this. But when Tony Visconti's soloing the bass in Heroes, it all makes, it's not that difficult. It's just fantastic when you put it all together. That inspired me partly to do that podcast because it was just so exciting listening to the different parts. And we spent so much time. I specifically spent so much time putting the art record together. I just thought it was a nice way of doing it. And the previous album of mine, This Garden is only temporary. I remember the having a UK tour, 22 dates being, I remember it being cancelled. The dates were cancelled one by one. And then until it got to about 10, and then they just cancelled all of them. And I thought, oh, wow, because of it was 2020. A lot, of, a lot of good bursts of artistic activity came out of the pandemic. I, I oh, okay. It, so. <laughs> Let's talk about this record. I'm not going to have the chance to play it or talk about this record. So I'm going to take you through how it's made. And that's how that podcast series started, the first series. Excellent. All right. Here it is. Italian Girls on Mopeds from Boy 40 2003. Thanks. So long. Thank you, Mark. What a pleasure. <laughs>
Italian girls, Italian girls on mopeds, Italian girls, Italian girls, Italian girls. Thank you so much to Andy, somebody who really appreciates this kind of format. Please check out his stuff at andywhite.com and look for this podcast is only temporary where he's continuing to go through every song one by one on the at album. And maybe I'll get to talk more about that album on this podcast sometime if Tim Finn will ever talk to me. The Finn brothers are among my favorite bands, Crowded House, Split Ends all the way back to the 70s. I had Phil Judd, the other original Split Ends songwriter on this podcast, a number of years ago. That was a big touch point for me in college to expand my horizons. Next episode, I am talking to Tim Lee and his wife, Sue Bauer Lee. Tim is best known for his work in the 80s with Windbreakers, but he's had many solo albums and the Tim Lee 3 and... For the past decade, he has had a duet with Sue called Bark, where it's just her drumming and singing and him playing a bass six. So it is sort of a cross between a bass and a guitar, also singing, and they can make a lot of noise, just the two of them. So that was wonderful. And then uh, Tom Heyman, another sort of Dylan-esque singer-songwriter like Andy White, but also very well known as a steel guitarist, a lead guitarist on a number of other people's albums, Alejandro Escovedo among them. So come back for those. NakedlyExaminedMusic.com is where you subscribe to the podcast, where you get all the old episodes. If you're for some reason listening to this through the Partially Examined Life feed, why don't you go over there and subscribe to it directly? I would really appreciate it. I would also very much appreciate if anyone would like to support the effort. Go to patreon.com slash nakedly examined music. You not only get ad free episodes, which you can still listen to in the podcast app of your choice, including Spotify, but you also through the Patreon interface get my detailed notes for the episodes, all these many, many lyrics. In my charting out where in the song each thing's happen, when a piano comes in, when an organ comes in, where there's a harmonica solo, all these things that were not specifically mentioned on the episode, but might help open the song up for you to look at those while you listen to the song. I hope you're doing well. I know I've been given some updates on my own music lately. I've now gotten together I, four or five times with a new group of musicians that are great, and they seem to like all my original songs. I have at least half an album written of new stuff, and we'll pull in some old songs as well. And we're learning a lot of covers, so who knows how long it'll take that project to incubate before a recording, a demo even, comes out of it. But sometime this year, it'll happen. You can get all my old music at marklint.bandcamp.com. And if you look me up on Facebook, you can actually hear demos of the new songs. Thank you so much for your attention. Until next time, keep on musicking. This is Mark Lintzemeyer signing off.